afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Peniel Joseph, uh, and uh, we are thrilled here at the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy to continue our virtual uh, William C. Powers um, speaker series. Uh, and we have um, a very, very uh, honored guest with us, Dr. Tressie uh, McMillan Cottom uh, today. I'm gonna do the introduction. I wanna thank um, at the outset, uh, Emily Dunkley, our program coordinator for helping us um, to organize this and, and all of our events and really uh, thank um, the supporters uh, and, our, and our, our patrons who are on our CSRD advisory board and uh, uh, Jeannie and Mickey Klein uh, who, who um, helped to uh, sponsor this series. Um, and really for all the folks who've been supporting us um, over the years, but definitely through this very uh, trying year, uh, 2020 of um, plague, pandemic, protest, but hopefully opportunity and transformation as well. Uh, without further ado, I'm very, very pleased um, to uh, introduce uh, really one of my uh, intellectual heroes, <laughs> uh, Dr. Tressie McMillan Cottom, um, who's a professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in the School of Information and Library Science. Uh, and a senior faculty researcher at the Center for Information Technology and Public Life. But really, Dr. Cottom is um, recently a MacArthur uh, Genius Award winner, uh, THIC, uh, which is a collection of uh, essays around uh, the centrality of Black feminism to the American Democratic Project, which is the conversation I want to have uh, today with her. Really, this extraordinary book, I teach this book. Um, I think she has a unique voice. She has hundreds of thousands of followers, both uh, on her podcast, Here to Slay with Roxanne Gay, but also just in terms of pop culture. I've uh, read her essays. I've read her op-eds. Uh, uniquely talented voice that merges. Those of us who are at the policy school, we're always being told that we want to have public facing impact. You know, We want to impact the debates. Uh, that are going on around voting, around immigration, around the environment, around mass incarceration, poverty, housing affordability. Uh, Dr. Cottom does. <laughs> so she has real world impact. So she's not just in the ivory tower or the ebony tower, however we want to situate it. Um, she's really, uh, her, 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 she's a thought leader. And that's why the MacArthur, um, the MacArthur Fellowship is really an acknowledgement of her thought leadership and the impact that she's really having uh, on issues of race, democracy, higher education, technology, feminism, uh, women, voting rights, uh, a real spectrum. And I wanna have that conversation, but we're really thrilled um, to have uh, you here, Dr. Cottom. Uh, and I, I just wanna say it's, it's a real honor. I've been in a space uh, intellectually of black feminism for the last 27 years having been advised by um, Sonia Sanchez, Professor Sonia Sanchez at Temple University, one of the icons of the Black Arts Movement. Yeah. And I think THIC is really in that tradition. I remember reading this bridge called Our Back, uh, but some of us are brave. Uh, I'm thinking of Audre Lorde, I'm thinking of Barbara Smith and the Combi River Collective, obviously Angela Davis, but Patricia Hill Collins and Black Feminist Thought. So when I read THIC, I, I look at the evolution and the amplification of, of, of this real tradition. And obviously Ida B. Wells, Anna Cooper, there's a new biography of Mary Church Terrell. Paula Giddings has the towering work on, on Ida B. Wells and so does Mia Bay. So um, this is such a huge rich tradition. Uh, Martha Jones, Vanguard just came out and me and Martha were on the time uh, 100 <laughs> books to read uh, 2020 about black women and voting rights because we always forget that black women helped uh, get that 1920 amendment, but couldn't vote. <laughs> you know, they they helped make it made it possible for white women to vote, but couldn't vote on mass until August 6, 1965. So this is this incredible year of I think black women helping to save democracy. So it's really an honor post election to be able to have um, you join us. Well, thank you so very much for that lovely introduction and for setting a lovely table. You do, you set a lovely table of ideas, uh, uh, the context of the ideas, which makes my job always a lot easier and a lot more enjoyable. So thank you for that. Uh, it is actually an honor to be here with you, to be with uh, the, the UT audience, and in particular to talk about something that we don't always center um, as a conversation about democracy and about public life. We don't 
always think of Black women uh, in those contexts. We, of course, think about, I think, the struggle for civil rights mm -hmm. more broadly. Uh, we think about provisioning, the social policy provisioning. Uh, we think about maybe sometimes as motherhood and uh, inequalities in work. But one of the things that excites me intellectually and creatively is to think about the scope and the bounds and the nuances of public life when we think about Black women um, as democratic actors, um, which is something I have in common with and owe a great deal to people like my friends, Mar my friend Martha Jones, to Keisha Blaine, to so many Black women thinkers and scholars, especially the contemporary ones, um, who I think have sort of brought that conversation of Black feminist thought, the, the potentiality of Black feminist thought uh, into its maybe not natural progression, but into its inevitable progression into a full circle of thinking about Black women in these really full nuanced ways that says that the project of Black women's intellectual lives um, is not incidental to understanding democracy, that it is in fact central to the democratic project for lots of reasons, because the nature of production was, um, was fought through our bodies, the, uh, the evolution of uh, the Republic was fought through our participation in political and public life. Mm -hmm. We are still central to the ideas of this country as a uh, center of globalized financial power and capital. The very nation state, the very idea of the nation state still very much lives on and through black women's bodies um, and intellectual selves. Um, and so that you can't understand the democratic project uh, in the United States of America anyway, without understanding black women as democratic actors. So it's wonderful to be, be here and speak with you today. And thank you for teaching the book and being so very lovely to the work. <laughs> no, no, you're very welcome. You know, my first question for you, Dr. Cottom is how do you define black feminism? Because I think we live in a, we live in a world where I think that one of the things that frustrates me is that when people see black before something, they don't understand its universal application, even, even potential allies. They yeah. think that you're talking about something narrow. And I think one of the things that was so profound to me about learning about black feminism uh, was finding about how finding out how capacious, you know, you think about the Third World Women's Alliance. Uh, you, you, you think about this idea of a capacious notion of getting us to a post-patriarchal version of masculinity and femininity, identity, gender identification, sexuality, society. It's sort of a true revolution of values like Dr. King talked about. So how do you define Black feminism? That's a great question. And one that um, is perhaps all the more provocative because it just seems so taken for granted for me that I am often stunned when I move about in my in the world and in my in you know in the nature of the work that we do in my life uh, and find that other people don't have such a clear taken for granted understanding of what black feminism is. So I often have to step back and remember that the rest of the world is you know can be quite out of step. Um, with what's for something that has just been so central to my understanding of the world, you know, long before I'd ever read Patricia Hill Collins or um, uh, you know, Barbara Smith, um, uh, Angela Davis, uh, Elaine Brown, so many people who eventually would end up shaping, uh, you know, my philosophical understanding of Black feminism. I knew what Black feminism was, like every Black woman I knew knew what Black feminist thought and praxis were. Um, and so at the heart of it for me is very basic, which is that Black feminism proposes that Black women are human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and that is as radical as the oppression that would confuse us about that reality would have it to be. It is actually just a basic truism, but it's only radical in the sense that everybody else has not always agreed with that supposition. So when we say that Black women are human beings, there is nothing about the human condition that you do not understand if you understand it through Black women. In the same way that we build uh, philosophies based on white men's uh, Western-centric, uh, Eurocentric view of the world, uh, you can do the same thing with Black women. And in fact, when you do, you do not have the same blind spots that you do when you center white men in your philosophical worldview. 
that the intersections of humanity exist, the fullness, uh, the complexities of humanity exist in Black women because Black women are human beings. Now, the feminist part of that is uh, a political project. Right. So there is the humanistic part, which to me it says black, because if you think that black people are human beings, then black and human are synonymous and to use black in no way delimits our understanding of humanity. But feminist is a political project. Now that is the part where if you put black and feminist together, you get a praxis of how do we move our political understandings in the direction towards black women's humanity. So if we assume that black women are human and black is synonymous with humanity, then feminism is the project of freedom. Feminine, that's it, uh, uh, and freedom for everyone. Um, so if you put black feminism together, you've got a humanistic project with political praxis. And there isn't anything more universal to me than that. <laughs> uh, uh, black feminism, I was talking with, uh, actually with Martha Jones recently and I was talking with Tanya McKinnon, who's a, a Black woman literary agent and represents a lot of some of our greatest yes. Black women uh, writers, Brittany Cooper, for example. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about this just last week uh, on the show. And then afterwards, we had a, um, a little kiki section online. <laughs> we were saying, she, she calls her work, she says she is a, um, she is a Black woman feminist identified practice. Yeah. And we were talking about what that meant. She said, she said, you know, I won't work with anyone at this stage of my career who does not understand that Black feminism is about universality. Mm -hmm. And if they don't understand that in a very concrete way in their work, she said it can't actually be progressive. Uh, and it certainly can't be radical. Uh, and that's also my understanding of it, that a Black feminist practice is one that understands uh, the, the universality of Blackness, um, that feminism is a political project of freedom uh, that has both a philosophy and a praxis, uh, and that to do both is to set everybody free. Yeah, and that's a great starting point for us because I want to talk from top to bottom about this current political moment. And I'm going to start with the grassroots uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement, because I think in a lot of ways, what I find so extraordinary about women, Black women like Tamika Mallory yeah. and Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors uh, and Brittany Packnett and just no name and so, so many different folks, not just from St. Louis and Ferguson, but around the world, around the country, who are finally getting their due and their proper respect uh, and really the visibility that so often has eluded them um, because of the politics of patriarchy. And we, we've even seen that when we think about um, Ice Cube and his plan and sort of, you know, trying to step out in front. And it's always a bad idea to negotiate with white supremacists. And I, I've written that and there were black men who were pushing back against me because they don't, they, don't, they don't get it. And how do we get to that post-patriarchal masculinity that Brittany Cooper and so, so many other men talk about, so many other women talk about, but some men like Mark, Mark mm -hmm. Anthony Neal, Mark, other, other Mark Lamont, I think. Mark Lamont Hill. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Robin Kelly. So there's, you know, yeah. there's, there's, yeah. there's folks, but, when you think about Black Lives Matter, let's talk about um, Black feminism. Uh, Barbara Ransby has the great book on you know, making all Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Beth Ritchie has her great book on arrested, uh, development arrested. There's, there's so many different precursors to Black Lives Matter that involve Black feminists, mm -hmm. uh, including Third World Women's Alliance, including the Combi River Collective. But what's so extraordinary is to find Black feminist, that Black feminist project in all its intersectionality, including um, um, trans Black women and others, um, centering this social movement that really becomes the largest political mobilization in American history by 2020. But I think a lot of folks kind of don't get it in terms of like, you know, it's an incredible through line of how we got from yeah. Sojourner Truth, you know, aren't I a woman, uh, ain't I a woman, or Mariah Stewart, or Frances Harper, or Mary Church Terrell, or the women that Betty Collier Thomas talks about, the Black church women, or Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham talks about, right? Yeah. Or yeah. Nanny Helen Burroughs, right? And, and Black women labor projects. So, so um, Francie Wilson has the book, um, The Segregated Scholars, about Black women uh, who, were, who were labor scholars and economists and PhDs yeah. in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, right? So I, I, let's talk about that. I wanna talk about in what ways is it th th that, intersectionality of the Black feminist project 
in centering BLM has allowed BLM to be this very, very capacious movement um, that is talking about freedom really for everyone, you know, including immigrants, yeah. including non able bodied When I read a movement for Black Lives, the policy agenda, I'm floored, yet at the same time, the general public still doesn't think of it as this universal declaration of rights and citizenship and dignity for all people. It's a human rights document. I mean, it's modeled in many ways on, uh, the, you know, it is, it is in a lineage of documents about human rights. Yeah, the Movement for Black Lives uh, platform, um, which I also try to reference as often as I can because it refutes some of the more common um, uh, critiques of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, of the decentralization being a, an indicator of its inefficacy when in fact, to my mind, it is an indicator of how efficacious it is, right? That there is this cohesive framework um, and theory of change um, that is central to and embedded in those who organize under the banner of Black Lives Matter. Um, and mostly that's just people being willfully ignorant of it at this point. But um, yes, yeah, so this is a wonderful question. So to my mind, um, Black Lives Matter is and will, I suspect, be remembered for being the defining social movement of the birthing of whatever this new world will be in the 21st century. So depending on where you think the lineage of Black Lives Matter is, there Ferguson is a flashpoint. Um, but I think the awakening of the, the tapping of the capacity of uh, organizing um, started to happen around Trayvon Martin. So I, I put it about 10, 15 years prior. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things were happening at that time. Um, black feminist thought, the, the historical uh, lineage of phil the philosophy of black feminism um, had been unbound from some of its institutions, you know, the gatekeepers for some of that knowledge have been unbound, often by young people, but also got to give a lot of credit to the OGs of, um, you know, the 1950s, 60s, and 1970s movements, um, who kept these ideas in circulation uh, within, but also uh, with outside of academic institutions. Um, there is a very clear lineage to my mind from the chat books of the 1970s uh, to the intellectual discourse of black feminism that existed on Tumblr that really started to uh, awaken and radicalize a lot of young people um, to a philosophical understanding of the world that was rooted in black feminism. And that to me is part of the history of what black feminist thought did, which was that it produced its philosophy from praxis uh, and on, and because of that, uh, I think lived in organizing spaces in a way that other philosophies don't always do. So it was the theory that was at the right moment in the right cultural container, right, for Black Lives Matter when it is, I think, starting to find um, uh, its space for unleashing itself and its potentiality. The what is fundamental to me about Black feminist philosophy and praxis is that it does, it is fundamentally a democratic project in a way that as, uh, you know, civil rights movement historians um, have pointed out, the civil rights movement wasn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily true of the civil rights movement, which was extremely hierarchical, uh, mm -hmm. patriarchal, uh, as Higginbotham points out, also traffics and ideas of respectability. Uh, that is its own form of social class, hierarchy, and caste within the movement. Um, and Black feminism is a direct response to the limitations of that understanding of freedom getting and of social organizing. Um, and so I think it was, the, it was the philosophy that was primed and ready at the time that this, the historical apparatus of on the ground organizing was being awakened by this latest generation of America's social contract with black folk, which is the social contract is of course, we can, uh, you know, we can kill you at our convenience and we'll most definitely do it for uh, profit taking and extraction. Like the, the efficient killing of black bodies is a political project in and of itself. And so as those two things were meeting, Black feminism responded to a couple of things that had happened between the civil rights movement and this post-civil rights generation, mm -hmm. which was understanding the post-mortem of the civil rights movement, its limitations. Yes, the one, you know, it's, it's great uh, achievements, but it had started to understand its limitations. The Voting Rights Act was being relitigated. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and a lot of young people saw the limitations of narrowing your organizing uh, only to political or electoral politics that those things would then always be vulnerable to being relitigated. And so they saw the Voting Rights Act uh, struck down on their watch at the same time that they were watching the, uh, the massive explosion of, explosion of incarceration, again, on the ground. This is happening in people's everyday lives. Um, and they understood that one of the reasons why electoral politics had sort of narrowed the vision of freedom uh, 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 is that it did not include freedom for everyone on the same terms. I, 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 I'm so it, proud is not the right word because I'm not responsible for it, but I don't know, I'm deeply floored and uh, inspired by how Black Lives Matter has, has, has managed to hold simultaneously um, what true intersectionality always meant uh, but centering almost from the outset intersectionality and how it would organize itself. And I think that's why the movement is so powerful. This is mostly a young black queer led movement. And I think that matters um, in a way that, you know, would not have been possible, uh, you know, in 1965. Um, and that comes from black feminist tradition of saying that you start that your that if your philosophy starts with praxis, meaning who lives this experience, um, that you will always be elastic enough to be responsive to the times. And I think Black feminist thought was uniquely positioned to be elastic enough to respond to the intersecting oppressions of what were, what was happening in you know that tail end of 1990s, 2000s, early 2000s of what oppression had started to look like, how financialization had shaped it. Um, uh, you know, how the end of the Voting Rights Act was going to set up the terms of future social organizing and resistance. Um, and I think there's a reason that it was Black feminist thought that took us there and not perhaps traditional, um, you know, this, this movement didn't emerge out of the Black church and didn't no. emerge out of Black institutions. And I think there's a reason for that. Now, this whole notion of freedom, I want you to talk about and have a conversation with you about transforming that praxis into policy, mm -hmm. especially when I'm thinking, I'm thinking of people like Cori Bush, Ayanna Presley. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, AOC in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. AOC, you talk about intersectionalism. Um, she's, 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 she makes the connections, right? Yeah. Um, how do we turn this? I'm thinking of Stacey Abrams, of mm -hmm. course, Stacey Abrams. Uh, and Kamala Harris, right? Mm -hmm. um, all with, 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 at times, different ideological perspectives, yeah. right? Even as they're saying they're pro-Black women, mm -hmm. right? How do we- it's Very important, by the way. I think that is super important. This might be the first time that the political stage has a plurality of Black women's philosophical understandings operating at the same time within the political apparatus. The fact that they come from such different perspectives, yes, yeah, is so powerful to see. It's, it's very powerful. So uh, what I'd love to have a conversation with, how do we translate this into policy that's going to be radical and transformational? Um, especially when already people have talked about reconciliation and national unity. And I have to say personally, I'm all for reconciliation and national unity that is not at the expense of betraying black folks, black women, Right and betraying American democracy. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we cannot negotiate and reconcile with people who don't value and recognize our humanity. That's it, yeah, right? that's right. But we can have disagreements on how to end poverty. Mm -hmm. We can have disagreements about how to transform the environment, how mm -hmm. to transform the criminal justice system. But unless we have a common denominator and a base where I say, Dr. Cottom, you, your whole family, has as much a right to live and flourish as my family. Yeah, we're, we're in two different realities. That's right. So, so I, I want reconciliation without accountability, and I'm very, very serious about this. One of the things that we learn when we do pay attention, by the way, to Black political um, uh, histories, uh, and not just in the United States, but globally, is that you do not get to 
anything that looks like reparative social policy, reparations, you do not get to reconciliation without first truth. Uh, and, uh, and with truth has to come accountability. And if you do not have those two things, you're not allowed to move on to reconciliation. Reconciliation without accountability is just accommodation. Uh, and accommodation has been the, the mainstream political project of the last 20th century, absolutely, at least for at least the uh, tail end of the uh, last end of the 20th century. And that is what set up the conditions for massive oppression that we have seen at the start of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can't have, uh, that's not, it's not even reconciliation is what I tell people. We have to at least agree on the terms of the debate. <laughs> yes, I agree. And so, so when you think about how do we change this to policy with these black women, like we said, from diverse ideological perspectives, what can we do in terms of, you've got the Corey Bush from uh, Missouri, who really did something as part of the Justice Democrats uh, and we have more justice Democrats now, but she really upended an old school yeah. uh, African-American, the Ford family uh, yeah. that had held for decades. And Cori Bush is really speaking truth to power. How do black women translate the votes? You know, we, we talk about black women uh, saving, uh, you know, democracy in a way, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But how do we translate the, those votes and the organizing that black women did uh, I think the 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 data we have is 91% voted for right. Biden Harris. How do we translate that into real muscular pro democracy policies, mm -hmm. especially at a point where people are telling us uh, that same voting block that helped lead to this election victory mm -hmm. by the Biden Harris ticket is being told to get in the back of the queue or the back of the line. And the people who really we need to focus are on are the 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 opposition. The disaffected, yes, especially, the disaffected, especially white. Uh, yeah, the yeah. the disaffected rational white uh, voter, uh, as if that is somehow um, uh, the point of politics uh, in a plural uh, democracy. I so I think a couple of things about translating on the ground organizing into uh, political wins and a pol political strategy. I think the reason why we have seen so many women, uh, black women and women of color to include people uh, like, you know, Ileana Mara and uh, AOC uh, is because the project can't just happen from the center, that's one of the, I think the, one of the lessons uh, from Black Lives Matter in particular, which is that for you to push policy, you can't only have a black voice in, um, uh, you, know, you can't only have a black centrist voice. And I think this is important for a couple of reasons. If you only have a black centrist voice, you submerge your, um, the interest of your constituency become submerged to the larger political project of keeping the center together, of, of making the center hold. Mm -hmm. um, now there's a, you know, there is absolutely a role for uh, black people in, you know, in the center, but I do think we have to run and support people from the left. Um, and I'm not opposed to running and supporting people from the right either. Um, but I do think uh, there's something to having a plurality of political ideologies uh, coming from black constituents that is important to translating uh, these things into uh, policy. Because then people have to negotiate uh, with the complexities of your constituencies. Um, in some ways, when you only argue from the center, you never really get to uh, put forward um, uh, your constituents needs. You don't get to single them out. I think one of the reasons why Corey did such a great job um, in this election and why they were able to run is because the Justice Democrats, I think, understood uh, that we could, that the, that we could run a Black woman on a platform that was not centrist and that that would speak to a segment of the Democratic elect, uh, electorate in particular um, and that that could work Right, this comes out of labor organizing, the history of labor organizing and black women's roles in labor unions who have traditionally not done a good job of running black women's voices um, uh, from their parties and, and supporting them. Um, 
and that they have figured out a language to do that, especially at the local and the state level, I think it's hugely important to turning that into a political apparatus. We can't all come from the center or even the center left. And you're gonna to have to get some plural voices because I think the, the energy of fighting out over what will be, you know, what are our shared interests uh, brings more people into that segment of the party. Um, it, that's especially important when right now to have to represent black women, we can't just represent black women of a certain social strata. Uh, you know, black working class women exist. Uh, when we talk about the working class, we usually use it as a euphemism for white. Um, but if you're talking about economic insecurity and economic vulnerability, and you're not running black women, there's no way you're talking to that part of your constituency and your voting block. And if you aren't talking to them, they will not elect you. And then you won't be, you won't have a seat at that table. I, I think we're not competing for the people who need people to compete for them. But that when we do, what Corey's win, I think particularly shows us is that when we do compete for them, when we do compete for their vote, um, we expand the electorate. And that to me is the power base for creating policy, expanding the electorate of getting more people involved um, so that you can then have a substantive, substantive, substantive policy debate, um, which just doesn't happen if everybody is kind of funneled into the same um, pipeline uh, into uh, you know, the political center. Um, one of the things that I think uh, AOC does really well um, is articulating that for voters. Right? Um, and something that Black Lives Matter has been training people though, in partnership, I should say, with tons of other on the ground uh, local organizers across the country. There has been, uh, you know, more democratic education has come out of Black Lives Matter, so much of it Black women and Black femme led um, and Black non-binary led um, to just educate people about what the political process is. There was a huge gap in political knowledge and education, I think at the tail end of like the um, you know, 1980s, 1990s um, black political dynasty and this emergence of the 21st century black political bloc. And they have just taken seriously educating people on what the political process is and what is possible and how we do that. I see it a lot at the local level where, you know, teach outs and teach ins, yes, absolutely, but training people on what their local apparatus is for change. There's so much potential there at the local and the state level. And if we didn't learn anything from the last four years, I hope that we have learned that it is extremely important for us to be as engaged at the state and local level as it is at the federal level, uh, because policy happens in both arenas. Absolutely, Th this leads me to my question about defund the police, uh -huh. uh, because Connor Lamb and other centrist Democrats have really pushed back against oh, the yes. They push back against the justice, justice Democrats. Yep. They push back uh, saying that they lost seats. Uh, House of Representatives Democrats ended up losing four or five seats. They had been projected to gain seats. Democrats mm -hmm. uh, right before this election had been uh, uh, projected at times to get up to 57 Senate seats. Uh, they left with 48 and this uh, two seat Georgia runoff, which is gonna decide the balance of power in the Senate. Mm -hmm. One, I want to get your perspective on defund the police, a black feminist perspective on defund the police, mm -hmm. why um, defund the police and sort of refund and reinvest in communities is so important. But I want to get to, to away from, there's been such drama about the term, mm -hmm. this idea. And I know I have centrist friends, some who may be on this webinar who say, well, defund the police, even black communities don't want oh, to defund yeah. the police. Oh, listen, yeah, no, my, I'm in those communities too. We're yeah. not excited about defund the police. Uh, bro, yeah. listen, I'm in a sorority. I went to a historically black college. I'm in those Facebook groups. I know that, yeah, we're not all excited about it. So what do you think of defund the police? And do you think defund the police hurt the Democratic Party uh, in this past election? Mm -hmm. And do you think people should keep saying defund the police or reimagine public safety, having a different- God bless us, reimagine public safety. Isn't that adorable? Uh, <laughs> let me tell you what Black folks know how to do. Black folks know how to tell a good story. And we underestimate the power of storytelling and politics to our peril. You know, we know on a gut level that reimagine 
the <laughs> public safety does not sound as good as defund the police. You cannot tell me that you're going to come, come to people with the with the the deep, rich legacy of oral history that Black people have and convince me that they think reimagine public safety sounds good. So let me, let's just get that off the table. This, this doesn't even pass, pass, pass the basic hip hop test. This, that's not a hotline. That, that's not a good, that's not a good bar. How about, about refund the community? Yeah, they, come on. No, we know these aren't good lines. One of the reasons that we're even debating it is because defund the police, sound, it works. Just on the, just at the level of political communication and that people pay attention to it and they engage with it. Now, whether they agree with it is the space for political education and negotiation of how actual policy gets made. But I mean, why we would shoot ourselves in the foot by taking away so, a, a powerful political communication tool like a banner that actually resonates with people is beyond me. But they don't call and ask me. Well, they do sometimes, but, but they don't call and ask me. So, but I think um, people are talking about it because um, centrist Democrats and even con obviously conservatives, uh, police unions mm -hmm. are saying defund the police is so negative. Even as I understand that defund the police as activists have articulated is really all about investing in poor segregated black communities for justice. And, and the gap there, the opportunity there then is for political education. Mm. It is not for writing a weaker story. Do you see? Mm -hmm. So for me, the, the democratic potential is for, again, I'm going to go back to my earlier point when we were talking about, um, you know, everybody, the, the debate about how we lost seats because um, defund the police didn't work. It didn't work for your current electorate. And one of the things that Black Lives Matter has been arguing for, and many other, again, on the ground organizations, is that you expand and educate the electorate. If you had expanded it beyond conservative light Democrats, maybe defund the police would have had more political efficacy in your favor. I also challenge the idea that defund the police was powerful enough in this election cycle for that to be necessarily true. Listen, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a crass materialist when it comes to these things. Um, and, and my read and talking to people, I was talking, um, oh gosh, uh, to some people from us, um, Fair Fight, Stacey Abrams team, um, the, the real issue seemed to be that you didn't spend money in the right places. Money just still matters. Um, and that people on the ground are saying, yeah, defund the police may have, you know, helped to tar their, uh, you know, to tar Democrats um, as uh, socialist. Uh, but here's the thing, in, in competitive races, the Republicans are always going to call you a socialist. Mm -hmm. They're going to call you a socialist, whether you say defund the police or not. <laughs> the question then on the ground is, did you spend more money to talk to more people to convince them that wasn't true? Did you knock on more or fewer, more or less doors? Did you do more or less democratic education? Did you do more or less responding to people's material needs in your district? That is actually what turns out uh, votes. Um, so there is, the, you know, there's this conversation about losing the public narrative. Um, that is, you know, that's a fine conversation and important, but it is not a singular explanation for why some of these races were so tough. And in fact, if you go race by race, I'm uh, just left uh, moved from Virginia, and you look at the Spanberger uh, race, for example, there was nothing Abigail Spanberger was going to do in her very right leaning district where she was not going to be associated with scary socialism by her opponent. The idea that defund the police is what made her race uh, so tough is reductive in many ways. Um, so I think that the potential, I, you should know that I personally believe that defund the police is similar uh, to cancel student loan debt and that it is good political messaging if you make it mean what your electorate needs it to mean. <laughs> Right? You can debate the policy merits and what you put then under that umbrella, but did it excite some part of your base? Yeah. Well, exactly. then, you, then you've got the potential to educate your way into policy. Um, we said the same thing about canceled student loan debt five or seven years ago, and I've been deeply involved in that moment. Um, 
But it's the reason why a Biden-Harris administration today is taking quite seriously what student loan debt cancellation will look like in their first 100 days. You don't get there without a politically powerful narrative. Um, and reimagine public safety just ain't it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, before we get to our q and I'm gonna ask about somebody who's near and dear to all of us here at uh, University of uh, Texas, Stacey Abrams. Yes. Uh, and what's you. happened in Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, and Stacey, obviously Spelman, she's got the HBCU, she's got Yale, she's mm -hmm. got, so we, a lot of folks take her, she's uh, Delta. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, folks taking credit and um, um, Kamala Harris is AKA. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. As if, so, as if so, they let us forget. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so Delta and AKA. So we've got Stacey Abrams, this, this, this giant of a figure of democracy, and then yeah. the vice president. So two of the um, uh, black uh, or the two of the divine nine mm -hmm. has really showed out this year. I want to talk about Stacey Abrams briefly in the sense of a few things. One, she was up for VP. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of people were disappointed in the black community that she actually was not the, the nominee. Yeah, I was personally disappointed, yeah. 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 Um, two, uh, I wanna talk about the extraordinary work she did in Georgia and I don't think it's been getting enough attention. And I think it's because she's a black woman so I wanna focus, yeah. focus on this. That um, 600,000 new voters into the democratic process. Uh, it's important for us to remember in 2018 it seems like Stacey Abrams had a really good shot to be the first mm -hmm. black woman governor of any state in the United States mm -hmm. in American history, if not for real active voter suppression by then Secretary mm -hmm. of State and, and now Governor mm -hmm. Brian, Brian Kemp, right? So, mm -hmm. and instead of uh, packing up and going home or being frustrated, I, the she reason why- Black woman thing yeah. imaginable. <laughs> and that's why I wanna talk about her. Yeah. So, I want to talk about the resiliency, and I think it's yeah. important for all of us in this year of 2020. I think Stacey Abrams really reminds me of, um, you know, as somebody who reads the Bible and somebody who's a Christian, of the steadfastness of 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 Job and the steadfastness of people like uh, Jeremiah and and oh, Rebecca amazing. and and so so many different biblical figures from the Old Testament, you know, yeah. because as we know, a lot happens in the Old Testament. I think a lot of us in America, we want to focus on the New Testament. Isn't that so American of us, <laughs> by the way? American. It is. <laughs> like the Old Testament, it's filled. There's a lot of reckoning that happens and a lot of um, uh, what Dr. King called unearned suffering happens in mm. the Old Testament. And that happened to Stacey Abrams, that's happened to black women and men historically. Um, we're talking about as a black woman, she's so resilient. I want us to talk about Stacey Abrams and how she symbolizes. There's so, there, in a way, black feminist praxis at this high level uh, is so, and, and to, to, you know, the reason why uh, uh, President elect Biden has the opportunity to even win Georgia, and that's where we're missing the lead, is because of a black woman, but all these other women organizing, you know, Carol Anderson at Emory. Right. So, you know, uh, one person, no vote. So many different black women on the ground organize and they're organizing for all of us. Yet when they ask for their turn at that, people say it's too narrow. Yeah, it, right? and that is, it is an allegory for the black feminist uh, you know, history, right? It, it is allegory for what, how black feminism has had to function and thrive uh, within, uh, within the ways that, uh, you know, white Western, uh, particularly United States, um, uh, you know, uh, the idea, the limited idea of who the Republic was supposed to exist for has delimited Black feminism. There's nothing more uh, Black feminist praxis to me than losing because the other side cheated and deciding to double down <laughs> on winning, not for yourself, but for someone else, because your eye is always on the project of freedom. Uh, the Combined River Collective says that if uh, that for any of us to be free, black women have to be free. Yeah. That in freeing black women, everybody will be free. There is nothing to me more emblematic of that than what Stacey Abrams did. Listen, Stacey is the real deal, by the way, I've got to say in my personal estimation. Uh, she was our first guest on Here to Slay. And let me tell you something, when you call no track record, right, and you call who at the time was still being considered as a top contender for a vice president slot, by the way. So 
you know, she's operating in this political space. And we go, listen, we wanna have a real serious conversation amongst black women about uh, political life. Uh, can you come on? Literally said, I'll talk to you in between flights at the airport if that's all right with you, but I just want to be there. That's the real deal. Um, and not just because she like did it for our show and for our favor, but that she understood and valued having those conversations for and among black women as not being separate from her work of running for visibility in the Democratic Party. Um, for so many, you know, there, for many people, uh, becoming a rising star in the Democratic Party means shoring up your black base early so that you can move on to yeah. shoring up <laughs> the white moderate base. And Stacey does not understand that to be how you win. Um, and I think it is a clear eyed assessment of the political realities of electing Democrats in the United States of America as the electorate currently exists. That's what Stacey Abrams had, a data-driven, yes, but also intuitive, um, and I think emotive uh, understanding of what was possible in Georgia. And understand and putting those two things together when uh, the Democratic Party was not willing to invest money down ballot in Georgia, Stacey Abrams said, I have been out there county by county and I'm telling you we're leaving votes on the table. When they when it didn't pan out for her in her run for governor, uh, it would have been both easy and I suspect professionally um, feasible and beneficial to her. For her to have said, oh, well, my bad, and to try to start, you know, negotiating for her own political trajectory within the party by moving into some other, uh, you know, uh, trying, to, trying to get some other type of appointment. Instead, she said, I know this to be true. I'm going to demonstrate it to you. I'm going to show you. And she built in conjunction with lots of other on the ground organizers across the state of Georgia, both a sophisticated an accessible political organizing tool that turned out the existing vote and expanded the electorate. She showed the Democratic Party how to win. That is a Black feminist approach to political activism um, and participating in the political system, which says that a win or loss for me individually has absolutely nothing to do with the Black political project. The political project is how can we win? How can we win? Um, and what Stacy showed us is possible is what we've always said is possible when you listen to Black women in a concrete way, which is because we are listening, we are paying attention. And so you tap into those knowledges when you do that. Um, and it has not just been transformative. Watching her work has not only been transformative for my understanding of what's possible in this political moment, but it has been transformative for my understanding of where we are in the trajectory of Black feminist thinking, that we are in this moment where Black women transformed our conversation of democracy and electoral politics feels both historically right uh, and um, and probably more than history deserves from us. But she did it, and I'm 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 extremely extremely um, buoyed by the fact that she did it. Yeah. All right, excellent. I'm going to have Emily come on here and ask the first question. We're going to seg yeah. into our Q and A. All right. First question from Cheryl, and she would like to thank you for your work to begin. There are many Black women scholars in religious studies who have embraced Black feminist thought and Alice Walker's term womanist, embracing intersectionality to excavate, explore, expose, and disrupt systemic oppressions, particularly white supremacist patriarchal misogyny that enables and requires sexism, racism, classism, ableism, heterosexism, and ageism. Have you engaged these thinkers? where would you have us focus as we move forward? Well, that depends on who we think the, uh, I'm a little unclear who the we is and that would matter because I think there's a slightly different project 
uh, depending on who is included in the we. There's work, for example, that I think white people have to do right now. I think there's work that moderates have to do. I think there's work uh, that black women have to do. So I'm gonna start more broadly uh, in responding to the question of have I engaged with womanism? Um, yes. And I actually have historically used the term black feminist and womanist interchangeably, um, which I'm not sure Alice would like, but the way that womanism has been taken up in practice, um, there's, there's, there's no distinction in practice. There's a meaningful distinction um, in um, intellectual histories and that is important to honor and to reproduce. Um, womanism was part of a sort of institutional response to the institutional exclusion of um, Black women's histories and um, intellectual biographies. Um, and so that is important. It's important to the foundation, to the, to the development of Black women's studies, um, for example. So it is important that we understand um, the context and the work that womanism was doing. Um, but like in everyday practice and everyday politics, if you use Black feminism and womanism to me in either context, I, I answer to both. Um, because they are, they, are, they are fundamentally engaged with the same political project. Um, so that is a, 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 way of, a long way of saying yes. And what would I have us do or like what we should do? I think as academics and scholars, uh, understanding what those different intellectual histories are is, would be nice. Uh, I'm in many rooms uh, where those distinctions are not salient. Um, and one of the things that I would love to see happen is that you cannot consider yourself um, an intellectual if you don't know those distinctions, right? We would, we know our distinctions. You know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a sociologist, and so uh, you know, knowing the distinction between like Durkheim and Weber is just foundational to who and what we do, who and what we uh, are as uh, dis disciplinary workers. Um, but we do not hold each other to the same uh, level of sophistication when it comes to understanding the intellectual histories of black feminism. And that's a project that I just think is always worth us pursuing and building out. I don't think you should be able to play in the sandbox if you don't know the difference. That's awesome, sandbox, I love it. Um, uh, Nina asked, Dr. Cottom, thank you so much for speaking to us today. I think of your essays, Know Your Whites and Black is Over or Special Black as key to understanding. And these are essays from Thick as key to understanding at least some part of American society's reaction to President Obama as a person and as a public figure. Mm -hmm. Do you think perceptions of President Obama, who by the way, just came out with the, and I'm a big- A little book. I teach uh, Michelle Obama's Becoming. Yeah. I'm gonna teach, you know, uh, you know, My American Promise or My Promised Land. Um, yeah. Obama, 887,000 in the first day. Uh, yeah. Um, his memoir. Do you think perceptions of President Obama uh, maybe by newly race conscious white people in particular have evolved since he left office? Oh, that's a great question. Is that, and I am, um, you know, uh, uh, Corona, COVID has really, really undermined my ability to, to do what I do to understand how people are uh, figuring out precisely that kind of thing and that I can't move about. Uh, so a, a lot of what I think right now is being fairly or unfairly shaped by just what I sort of see in social media and public discourse, which is which is to say it may not be accurate. So uh, there's a caveat there um, because if I'm not talking to people directly and seeing them in their natural habitat, I think I'm always missing some important data. I, but I do think a lot of this owed, by the way, to the type of public education that I think Black Lives Matter folks have done in mm -hmm. public spaces and in public life to push, as you say, the newly awakened, um, racially aware white moderate. Um, there's been a lot of education happening in a very short amount of time, um, which is why we see some of the tensions and the conflicts that we see in public life and in public discourse. And that's just because there's a rapid expansion of the vocabulary, of the ideas, of the frameworks of how we talk about race and racism in public life. And I think that's what people are feeling and are wrestling with. And so a lot of white identity voters, particularly white moderates and white centrists, I do think were newly awakened uh, to the concepts of race. Um, and Obama was probably the right candidate for that stage of awakening. But we have moved fast. And I actually think you see it in the way people are engaging with his book, 
we have moved fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, the level of sophistication in public discourse is not at all probably where some of us would like it to be. But as a person who looks at the trajectory of ideas, mm -hmm. it's moved fast mm -hmm. uh, that you have people seriously debating the finer points of intersectionality, like do we center sexuality in this way and what happens when we do, like that's where we now are in the discourse, which is actually very exciting for me to see. So yes, that is a long way of saying yes. I have seen a lot of who would have been the, you know, the mainstream Obama voter change and grow a lot in their racial understanding and are starting to wrestle with what they projected onto Barack Obama and what that says about them. Not what maybe it says about him, but what it says about them. And so I am seeing that kind of reckoning, yeah. We have some great questions. One is from Sahand, one of our CSRD fellows. I was inspired by, Dr. Kadam, I was inspired by your recent op-ed, The Danger in White Moderates Setting Biden's Agenda. Mm -hmm. I want to build on Dr. Joseph's question about the Democratic Party and truly America as a whole, providing tangible gains to Black Americans and specifically to Black women. Mm -hmm. What do individuals and organizations do if the Democratic Party does not step up to center Black, American, Black mm -hmm. Americans' voices mm -hmm. uh, and continue to appeal to the moderate white voice? In what ways can people wield their power without feeling shamed by the lesser of two evils choice every two to four years? Yeah, first of all, I think we're just always gonna experience that shaming process. I think that's as much part of politics as anything else. There's a lot of ritual shaming of, because some of what <laughs> politics is, is, you know, disciplining your party, right? It's bringing people in, it's, get, it's getting people on the same bench and it, you know, and all of that. And so there's always a tussle. And so, you know, maybe I've gotten a little jaded but I just expect it now <laughs> every four years. I am, as you know, it's not a secret. I'm left of where the mainstream democratic party is in the black leftist tradition, I should say, because I do think that is different and it matters. And so I get it every two, four years. Listen, I just know that coming for me, just block the time out on your calendar. It's gonna happen. Um, but I also think that that coming for each other is important. I don't think it's a distraction. I think that's how we fight out what matters to us. If you can't articulate it in those moments, it's usually a sign that you maybe need to think about what you believe in and, and what you're willing to exchange for that. That's called uh, you know agenda setting. To your larger question about how do we set our agenda and demand that people respond to it. I was talking to Kianga um, about this very thing and Derricka um, uh, Purcell were both on the show recently and we had the best Kiki session I have had in a very long time. Um, I think we were in there for three or four hours because nobody wanted to leave. Uh, because we were, we had been ritual shamed for a year and we were just so happy to be together and <laughs> it was a safe space. And we were talking about how are we going to hold people to the to account uh, in this moment? What, what will that look like? So I think a couple of things, and you know, we, we still figure these things out. Um, I think that we have to use, we have to get off the table the idea that politics is supposed to be something other than you reward the people who voted for you. Somehow mm -hmm. that has become uh, ridiculous to say in mainstream politics. And I think Republicans understand it quite clearly. But yeah. Democrats really struggle with the idea that no, that's quite literally what this is. You are supposed to reward the people who voted for you. Um, the second thing is that people will do what they can get away with. Politicians doubly so. Uh, so one of the things that I think I've learned from, um, uh, from organizers especially is keeping the light on the, when the when politics become boring right mm -hmm. you gotta have somebody assigned to keep the light on the boring part of the politics because that's where we always lose ground mm -hmm. it's always in some procedural trade-off right something once we've all stopped kind of paying attention because we have jobs and lives to get back to but that is a shared task that's why i think it is so important to be part of a group it is not something an individual voter is supposed to do so i think you cast down your buckets with some organization who shares enough of your own values that they will help you keep an eye on the political minutia as it starts to move because that's where we tend to lose ground. And then I think we start the electoral pro uh, process earlier uh, than the campaign, which I think again, organizers, especially in St. Louis understood, they never stopped organizing. Mm -hmm. Stacy never stopped organizing. Mm -hmm. 
And right, one of the things they said um, that um, organizers said in Georgia is that one of the mistakes that state Democrats have been making in Georgia for a long time is they only talked about voter registration. It was like get, getting out the vote is too late by voter registration period. Mm -hmm. It is supposed to be an ongoing conversation and somebody has to be mining that ship. When the Democratic Party knows somebody's been paying attention and they have kept the lines of communication open with voters through ongoing political organizing, they are too scared to come back to you without having done something for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I think, uh, one of the lessons I think we've learned um, from the last four years in particular, and I think one of the lessons that we should learn from like what they've done, uh, what Stacey's done in Georgia. We've got two good questions that I'll combine about defund the police. Mm -hmm. uh, Ramona uh, Houston, um, uh, who's saying greetings from Atlanta and Ashton Cumberbatch, who's, who's um, a local thought leader. Uh, Ramona is saying that Cancel student debt can't be misinterpreted, but defund the police can. And Ashton adds to that by saying, could you please speak to combating the weaponizing of the term defund the police mm -hmm. by opponents to mean eliminating police or having an inadequate number of officers and therefore scaring many as opposed to right-sizing limited municipal resources to address racial inequities, injustice, oppression, et cetera. Um. So the first is, I got to tell you, we might have just missed, you know, and it's easy to have missed it. But let me tell you, cancel student loan debt could be misinterpreted and, and continues to be so, by the way. It's just mm -hmm. as a, now it's a losing narrative. Um, uh, but we fought that fight about it being misinterpreted, which was that we were going to give away money to rich people who had gone to college, that it was going to be regressive, uh, that schools would close because they'd go bankrupt because no, everybody was let off the hook for repaying the money because nobody understands how higher education financing works, you know, um, <laughs> that the middle class is going to be taxed. Yeah, yeah it, all of that happened. All of that happened. It just may have, you know, it, might have happened over in another space and you missed it. So actually, no, the misinterpretation absolutely happens and always happens. Again, with any salient public message, a public health message, any me public message is gonna be misinterpreted. The, the defund the police one feels different, I think to us, um, because police unions have a significant head start in demonizing. Yeah. Uh, you, what we are fighting, there was no union that we were fighting in higher education with student loan debt. Now we're fighting the banks, right, um, who are impressive lobbyists, but nothing touches police unions. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Yeah. Um, and so that's why this feels uh, more contentious. That's why this is fundamentally um, about labor um, and why we should probably understand like labor histories and why even probably calling police unions a union is a problem uh, <laughs> uh, and a misnomer and one that complicates public debates. Um, so there is though, however, I also want to be honest. Yes, there is a centrist, some might even say conservative street in many communities, including the black community yes. about yes. what we will lose yes. uh, if we quote unquote defund the police, whether they, we think that means not paying police officers, which is how some people understand it, or we mean reallocating uh, public funding. And I think that when you talk to black women in particular, this is how I understand that. I understand it to mean that black women understand accurately that they are vulnerable to state violence and interpersonal violence in a way that makes them particularly conservative about anything that will increase their risk of in daily life. Mm -hmm. And that is real. Mm -hmm. But in the same way, I think that Democrats need to speak to people concretely about their material conditions. I think this is where being a black feminist helps. I think black women are rational human beings. I fundamentally believe that. I think we make decisions rationally. Mm -hmm. So I think there is absolutely a way to talk to the material fears of black women's um, resistance to the idea of defund the police in a way that will expand our imagination of what it means to live without the police. I don't think black people are in love with policing. I mean, there are, you know, some because it's a public sector job and you know, and all of that, but I don't think we're in love with policing. I think we are rightfully afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to understand the fear and explain how we can respond to that risk and that fear without introducing another layer of risk and fear, which is what happens when the police show up.
Mm -hmm. So see, I just absolutely fundamentally think that we can have that conversation because I think that we have sense. And I think that to the extent that we have not approached black voters in particular with an argument that says, you are not crazy, they are out to get you, mm -hmm. but let me tell you what we do when that happens instead of calling the police. Um, that's work that can be done. The question is, do you think it's important enough to do the work? Mm -hmm. And do you think that black people are rational and human enough that they'll listen? So see, I think that we would, I think that we would. Oh, great, thank you for that. Uh, Christina, who's one of our fellows says, um, Dr. Cotham, I've been completely engrossed by your talk today. Thank you for being here. Yeah. You mentioned educating the electorate several times. You also mentioned how civics education started to fall off in the 80s and 90s. Can you share your thoughts on what teaching civic engagement should look like for people of color and white people in American public schools today? Oh, that's so exciting. Thank you for that, because that's right at the intersection of like, right, my interests, uh, education and work and schooling. So that really is, yeah, there's something there, right? So there's some history there about what happened to civic education that you know we won't, maybe won't get into, but if you're ever interested, send me a note because that's one of the things I geek out about too. Um, uh, you won't be surprised to learn that it's all about Brown versus Board of Education, like everything else is in schooling. It, it's as racist as you think it is. And you won't be surprised that we have a lot to blame Texas for. People know the history of textbooks and, and Texas and uh, in the textbook industry also won't be surprised by that. As Texas goes, education uh, curriculum goes in the rest of the country. Mm. Um, uh, so I, and this comes from my history of, uh, you know, come out of a black radical organizing tradition, but I'm also a, you know, a staid, boring academic like everybody else. So I'm sort of the intersection of being an institutionalist with, you know, a, a radical background in history. And that's a weird space to be in. I don't, civic, what Black Lives Matter got right is that civic education couldn't just happen in institutions. That's the first thing. Um, and that in fact, the, the concessions we have to make to civic education within um, schooling institutions uh, tends to undermine what we're trying to do with civic education. I'm gonna tell you what gets closer to it, ethnic studies programs um, and K through 12 ethnic studies. We have some empirical evidence that ethnic studies um, uh, provides uh, a, a civic identity and civic education, particularly to minority identified students in a way that a formal civics education does not. And I suspect that's about how it's packaged and the efficacy and agency that ethnic studies curriculums give to students, mm -hmm. because an important part of political education is making people feel agentic. You really got to give them the uh, understanding of themselves as uh, um, uh, as agentic people in the political process. And that's something that civic education tends not to do a really good job of. The best civic education that I've seen happens, happens outside of schools. It is happening in um, public spaces. Yes, it's happening in organizing spaces. It's happening in book clubs. And I maybe, and I don't mean the I don't mean the anti-racist uh, white book clubs that have become uh, all the rage lately, although they may have some potential, but they, th but they won't fulfill that potential on their own unless they understand themselves as being part of a political project. And I don't think that's happened. But things like I participate in um, uh, uh, democratic reading groups in uh, Washington, DC, one of the longest running leftist reading groups in Washington, DC also happens to be one of the blackest, by the way. Um, and one of the queerest, they get together in like church basements. And what, are they, what are they called? Uh, I think it's the, oh, my friend Charlie runs it. That's a great question. I'll find it and maybe you can okay, share yeah. it with our participants. Because yeah. Yeah, um, we had a conference in Richmond where we brought them down to train uh, other people how to have a book club that matters. We we're like, listen, we don't want to just have these book clubs. There's a place for that. But like, how have you built this sustainable thing? And they came down and they talked to us about, and they said, listen, the first thing is somebody always has to show up. So you gotta designate the person who will always show up even if no one else does. Is that because a big part of civic education is people don't want to be the only one participating. Mm -hmm. And if they think they're gonna show up and nobody else shows up at the party, they never become civically engaged. Mm -hmm. Then they talked about how do you talk about really hard texts, texts that are not written for the public, 
Um, and how do you make those matter in a real way? How do you break down a text with people who may have had negative experiences of schooling or formal education? Um, and so we talked about like, how do you have a book club that matters? And I think those are remarkably uh, progressive spaces for the type of civic education that I have seen work over the last four to seven years. And that is accessible to people, flexible, uh, democratic, um, and radical in its imagination of what people can do as political actors when they believe that they can. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think it's a really important part of the puzzle. You know, with the time we have left, I wanna um, now uh, gonna combine some questions, but really ask you a question. This, and, and, and I want you to, um, Dr. Cottom, to break this down for us because you, you're, you, you speak to so many people. You have, uh, I hope people, um, on this webinar after who've been introduced to you. I hope we've introduced new people to you, but really just um, Google and do research and just sort of see the breadth of your impact. Um, I wanna talk about the future of American democracy with black women being central to that future, both as political actors. You know, One of the great things um, Stokely Carmichael wrote in 1966 for the New York Review of Books was that uh, the future of democracy was in Fannie Lou Hamer and not Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. Because there was more black people who Fannie Lou Hamer was represented of, right. of than Dr. King. A, a beautiful line. I completely agree with it. It's one of the reasons why I fell in love with Sokli Carmichael. Um, black women are so key. What can we do in terms of, I wanted to ask you a charge question, but it's really a two part. The first part is black women in American democracy, both in Texas right here, we're facing all these struggles, all these problems, including the textbook stuff that you were talking about. But at the University of Texas, in terms of higher education, um, we have you know extraordinary scholars and colleagues here. Shout out to Dr. Dinah Ramey Berry, who's the chair of the history yeah. department, yeah. and Ashley Farmer uh, as well. So we've got all these extraordinary folks here. Keflin Brown, um, uh, Lisa B. Thompson. We have we have all these, but we're still there's still inequality here at University of Texas at Austin. Um, what can what can we do as actors? Sometimes my students always ask me, "What can we do beyond the vote, beyond the uh, mm -hmm. pro, pro, uh, political process?" Uh, you speak about higher education, technology, the way we can amplify our voices, and in doing so, amplify democracy. But you're also an expert on process. You're an expert on all these different things, and so there's a way to do things. And we've we've sort of normalized a lack of process, which is why the Supreme Court looks the way it does now. Why our democracy and institutions look the way they do. What can we do? Because here in Austin, we have a Silicon Hills, mm -hmm. not Valley, but Hills. Mm -hmm. A lot of money here, including white allies who are saying they want to do things. Yeah. What can we do? But I, I, I ask in such a panoramic way because I still feel the center of that is sort of Black people and Black women specifically and Black feminists mm -hmm. specifically. And there's a universal aspect of what Black feminism is arguing about democracy that will help us all if yeah. we only come though. So they yeah. built it, but it's about us. That's, that's right, we built it, will you come? Yeah, that, that, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, right <laughs> I'm right there. And I want you to give us that that charge. And again, I know it's a big question, but I know you know the way you think is in, in those big, big panels. Oh, well, thank you for that. The way I think may be, but you know, on the spot, it may not make as a whole lot of sense when I say it. So I'm gonna try on, uh, you know, one draft and let's see how it goes uh, with a big question. I may be biased, but I do think that black women have figured out something particular about this political economic moment. Um, and in fact, I've staked my whole professional career on saying that that's true. If I have a single, you know, academic um, professional objective, it is to prove that the political economy of Black women is the political economy of the 21st century, and that you don't understand one without the other. Um, and there are a couple of things that I think that we have figured out that make that both true and make it feel prescient in a way that it probably wouldn't be if people just paid attention as you have done as a history of Black feminism. It is not that Black women are soothsayers. It is that we have learned and been socialized and conditioned to identify and respond to the complexities of a complex moment. Now we have had to do it to survive and that's been what other groups have not had to do. And that's why they feel like they're late 
to the party. Mm -hmm. So when I say listen to Black women, I've said this before, it is not that Black women know everything. Mm -hmm. It is not that Black women are always right. It is that Black women are clear and sober about the political and economic conditions that are shaping our collective lives. Mm -hmm. When you put that at the center of any project, you become more clear and you become more sober. And I think this is a moment for clear sobriety in public life. Um, because of the way that money and power and politics operate in a digitally mediated society, Clear-eyed sobriety is the antidote to the obfuscation, the secrecy, the black box of financial power and political power that is reshaping both the United States democratic project, but the idea of democracy around the world. Mm -hmm. We are being held hostage to financial forces that look like social media, you know, we can blame Facebook and Twitter and we, and I do, by the way, seriously. Um, we can blame the impulses of techno-capitalism, which I absolutely do, that have reworked the social contract all around the world. The only, to my mind, response to that that has been, that has proven to be effective and reproducible is the type of clear-eyed sobriety that comes from Black feminist thought, philosophy, and praxis. And that is because we pay attention to the intersections of the political economy where the most vulnerable people are actively oppressed in the systems that are oppressing everyone, but to different degrees. I think that's a message that we have to take into public life and that there are ways to figure out how to do that. We don't all have to do that work in the same ways in the same arenas. And in fact, if we do, we won't be as politically effective. But I have felt in my own work that it was important for me to be involved in my corner of public life to say, there is a way to understand this moment that will make the moment more clear because I understand it through the lens of black women's eyes. Mm -hmm. That is, if that's writing for the public, if that's it affecting policy, if it's having Q and A's with Senate staffers, if it's meeting with presidential candidates, I do those things, but I don't do those as like professional work. I actually think of those things as my political work, mm -hmm. as my work as a democratic, a person, a participant in the democratic project, small d. Um, and I think that that is the way we have to all think of ourselves. And I think there have been a lot of incentives in the academy to not understand ourselves as part of that apparatus. Mm -hmm. If we haven't learned anything, however, the last four or five years, I hope we have learned that institutions are for, far more fragile than we have been promised they are. And they require constant caretaking to be democratic institutions. And so I think that participating in the larger democratic project does help save higher education because higher education and the academy only work if the rest of the political economy is working. We are not an island unto ourselves. Um, and so I think that participating in those ways is fundamentally black feminist praxis uh, because we've always had an understanding that of casting down our, our buckets where we are. And this is where I am. So I will cast these buckets down here, uh, much in the way that Stacy has done uh, in Georgia, um, which is to say winning and losing is not just about my personal uh, career. I think it is about the survival of the idea of democracy, which we've always only been half good at in the mm -hmm. United States. But I think only black feminists push it to be better. With the time we have left, very quickly, what, what should the Biden-Harris administration do the first 100 days, both for Black women and democracy? And as you've said, it's for both. So mm -hmm. what, what would be you know, three, four big ticket mm -hmm. items, first 100 days? Things that I would love to see happen. Yes. Um, I think 
well, because it's just been my political work. And so I think it matters, um, but it doesn't matter to all black folk. But I do think the idea of canceling student loan debt is about reintroducing the idea of higher education as a public good. So it isn't just about getting rid of people's debt as being an economic stimulus, which I think uh, uh, unfairly narrows the intent of that type of program. It is about saving the very idea of public higher education and saying that going to college should not make your life worse the way it has done disproportionately for black women for the last 20 years because we built a moral hazard of a student loan financing system. And I think that we have to make that debt good with the black women who took out uh, those student loans. That's who I think student debt cancellation should be for. Um, and that is an executive order issue and can be done in the first 100 days. I think that the a Biden Harris administration should take every opportunity to use executive orders to do what they can do because we don't know what will happen in Georgia. But even if Georgia works out the way that we hope it will do, there's so much to reverse uh, over the last four years to just even get back to what was, um, you know, just to even get back to zero. I would like to see that. I would like to see something that Kamala Harris has in fact um, uh, championed um, and supported um, in her time, which is centering um, maternal health as a public health campaign, mm -hmm. uh, black maternal health uh, in this country as a public health campaign and a public health message. Uh, and I would like to see a clear articulation of environmental racism come out in the first 100 days because I believe that climate change uh, is um, the logical ends of racist extraction um, and that it has to be part of a reparations project for saving black people's lives. Okay, and then finally, what is your charge to all of us? Any bits of inspiration, hope? What are you feeling for 2021? We have to think, uh, Dr. Cottom, uh, 2021 has to be better than 2020, right? How we, oh, how we you think yeah. that you're a biblical Old Testament person. Know, you know better being, than to say that. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm being overly optimistic. You and are. You, okay, <laughs> knock on all the wood. I'm, I'm a little <laughs> southern and a little... Well, I'm, I'm, I'll I, say I'm, I'm hopeful 2021 is okay. this year. Okay, I'm a little superstitious, so I'm gonna cover. No, I'm, I'm, I'm knocking over here on this. Thing. Yes. Um, okay, so black people have, you know, have thrived under uh, far more adverse conditions than those that we survived in 2020. So whatever it is, I think we'll be fine in 2021. The question is, is everybody else gonna break down and lose their minds? <laughs> and we'll have to clean that mess up yet again. Um, uh, so what was the question again? And what am I hopeful for in 2021? Yeah, yeah. Just hope, just any any hope for political transformation, a, a vision of national unity. Just just mm -hmm. yeah, our democracy. Our I think that if we hold everybody's feet to the fire politically on the issue of accountability, we can start to see a new kind of political discourse happen in public life. And I think. We are actually primed for it in 2021 to some of the earlier questions. I do think some people, uh, this may be a little Pollyanna-ish of me, I do think some people have done the reading though. And mm -hmm. I think it will, you will be surprised to learn who's been doing the reading and who has been doing the work. I am always uh, uh, afraid of the impulses of white moderate centrism in the Democratic Party. But I'm telling you, when, in my travels and in my work, the people I see willing to engage really tough conversations about, hey, what is racial capitalism? Mm -hmm. what, what, do we, what do you mean when you say intersectionality? What does it mean when you say prison abolition? People have been having some real conversation. And I think the fruits of, the, that, real, um, of that reading and those conversations and the work that people have been doing, I think we are primed to see those flourish in 2021 mm -hmm. in a, and I think we'll see that in a more nuanced, um, complicated public discourse about democracy uh, and the political project. And I think that's the most we can hope for in that first year after, you know, four years of nonsense, which is that people who have been doing the work will show up ready to have a real conversation in 2021. All right. So we're going to close it there. I'm going to say doc Dr. Tressie McMillan, Cottom. Uh, thick. Um, shout out to all the Black women on campus who I might not have mentioned, Dr. Cherise Smith, uh, head of ads, and Virginia Cumberbatch, and so many different Black women who are real thought leaders right here at UT, our students, faculty, staff, the whole works. Um, this is a must-read book, uh, Thick and other essays. 
Um, this was a National Book Award finalist. Uh, Dr. Cottom uh, is a MacArthur Genius Award winner. If you don't know, that's a huge big deal. Only a few thought leaders ever get this. Um, and uh, she's a best-selling author. Uh, she's host of the podcast, Here to Slay with Roxane Gay, who's another huge thinker. You have these two Black women who's Haitian. Um, I used to answer. Uh, yeah, I meant to point that out to you. Who's Haitian. Yeah. Who's Haitian. So this has been a real treat for us. All the um, folks who've been saying questions just uh, said how engaging it is and just how they can't believe it. But we're really lucky here at the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy and the University of Texas to really uh, bring um, global thought leaders like who you are, who are uh, influencing politics, technology, higher education, society, our democracy uh, in such big ways. Um, and you are really in the tradition of Black women who've been doing this for centuries in big, big ways. So uh, we're inspired by you. We're really honored by your presence here. This has been uh, a real uh, dream come true. Um, we're we're going to be on my podcast too. That's right. <laughs> to, to, to got a little one called Race and Democracy, not as big as here, here to slay, but we're, we're, I'm we're trying. To we're trying. Thank one you to the center oh. for willing to be and willing to host these kinds of conversations. They really do matter. And thank you for everyone taking time out to be. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Emily Dunkley. And thank you, CSRD Advisory Board. Uh, thank you, everybody here who's on this webinar. Uh, the struggle continues. I'm hopeful uh, post election that things will get better. I mean, we just have to work to make things better. Thank you so much, everyone.